Hello everyone and welcome to the Explore Graduate Studies in CSC. My name is Nikola Banovic and I'm an assistant professor at Computer Science and Engineering Department at the University of Michigan and I will be your host today. Um, now we're going to start, uh, although I believe some are still slowly joining us, um, but we will make sure that they also get um, all of the information uh, as uh, they join. Now, uh, I first want to say thank you all for joining us for this workshop today. It is really a great pleasure to see you. Uh, normally, uh, this workshop would uh, happen in person at uh, our uh, Beister building that you can see on the slide. You would have an opportunity to spend a day at the University of Michigan, meet with faculty and students, uh, get to know the campus and the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, unfortunately, this year we're virtual uh, due to the challenges that, that we are all facing. Um, but I still uh, hope that we're going to have a good program for you uh, today. Now, before um, we welcome you all and tell you more about Computer Science and Engineering Department at the University of Michigan uh, and this workshop, I just want to say that there are some links that we want to share with you. These are the links that you already received in your email, but I will paste them again in the chat right now. Out of these six links, the first three are highly relevant to today. The first one is the permission to record. This workshop, this virtual workshop is being recorded. Um, so please take a moment and fill out uh, the first link, the form uh, uh, from the first link. And then today, we're also going to have two panels that I'm going to talk about more in just a moment. Uh, and there are links to uh, Slido where you'll be able to ask some questions from our panelists. So throughout the day, please take a moment and fill out some questions. Uh, because if you don't, then I will be forced to ask our panelists some really, really hard questions. So it's on you. Um, also, of course, uh, during our panels, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to add questions uh, to these links, and then um, I'll be able to ask those questions, uh, our panelists. And then, of course, there are three additional links that we also prepared for you. One is a link to a virtual tour of both our campus, uh, Ann Arbor, and the kind of research that we do, uh, including uh, student life. Uh, so you have also links to two vlogs from two of our graduate students that will help you give you a better idea of what graduate students do at the Computer Science and Engineering Department at the University of Michigan. All right, so today we have a few activities uh, for you. All of them are virtual. Uh, first, uh, during this welcome hour, I will tell you a little bit more about the research at CSC, student life, and also uh, city of Ann Arbor, just to give you a bit of a a preview and then we'll take a, a break. Uh, this break, during this break, you will have an opportunity to grab breakfast if you're somewhere on the West Coast, uh, lunch if you're on the East Coast, and uh, well, I guess any other meal uh, if you're somewhere else in the world. Uh, but also during that time, we will keep uh, this Zoom meeting going. I will randomly split you into breakout rooms uh, and give you an opportunity to, while you're catching a break, chat with your peers, uh, with other attendees, 
uh, give you opportunity to meet uh, them just like you would uh, had you been here in, a, in, in person at, in Ann Arbor. And then at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, all of these times are Eastern time, uh, we will come back for a faculty panel where we will have five faculty join us and answer your questions. As I mentioned before, there is a link to Slido. It is a web application where you can ask your questions to our panelists, and then we will select questions and ask them, and then we'll have an opportunity to, to answer them for you. Uh, we will have a short little break between the faculty panel and graduate student panel, where again, I will try to split you in groups together with our panelists to give you an opportunity to briefly chat with them um, in, in smaller groups, uh, after which we will move on to the graduate student panel, where I hope you will have an opportunity to ask your future peers and colleagues uh, more about student life uh, and anything that is relevant to, to um, uh, being a, a graduate student. And then we'll take another short break, give you an opportunity to talk to our panelists again. But once we come back, we will actually go through steps required to apply to graduate school. And in particular, we're going to focus on some of the materials that you have to prepare and perhaps gives you, give you some tips and suggestions for how to prepare those materials. And then we're going to have some closing notes um, and of course, give you an opportunity to ask any um, uh, parting questions at that time. So as I mentioned before, the in-person event would give you an opportunity to learn more about the research that we do from the researchers themselves, both faculty and students. Uh, unfortunately, today you're stuck with me. Um, so I will try my best to uh, give you an overview of different research and concentration areas in computer science and engineering. Now, at CSC, the University of Michigan, uh, we have almost, well, actually we have all subfields of computer science well represented. Uh, they're researchers in theory, systems, hardware, interactive systems, uh, and AI. And actually the photo that you're seeing here is of Alex Halderman, one of the, the faculty, and uh, actually one of our lecturers who used to be his his PhD student um, working on one of the servers in our Weister building. Um, Alex is uh, one of the experts in the field of uh, computer security, in particular working on securing uh, the elections. Uh, so any kind of technology used uh, today to uh, support uh, our democratic process in the United States, um, a lot of it is based on technology and Alex and his students and his research group are working hard to making sure that they address any kind of threats uh, to that technology. At the University of Michigan, we have researchers who are working on novel uh, ubiquitous computing hardware and devices who are creating some amazing technology like the example that you see here of a wearable device that can be used for uh, voice authentication. We have research on, in AI and machine learning uh, that enable novel interactive systems, for example, uh, advanced conversational computing systems. And as you can see at CSC, it's not just the faculty and students. Uh, we also have extensive collaborations with the industry to enable this kind of technology and make sure that the work that we do has an impact uh, outside of just academia. Researchers also look at the security of different hardware systems. So this is uh, Professor Kevin Fu, 
uh, demoing um, one of his uh, one of his creations, uh, in which they have shown that many of our existing um, hardware devices, especially medical hardware devices, uh, are susceptible to attacks uh, using nothing more than just sound waves. Um, and perhaps you had an opportunity to also read about some of these stories recently about how some of the researchers and security from the University of Michigan CSC uh, were able to break into uh, Alexa, uh, not just from sound waves, but also using lasers and other uh, interesting uh, technologies. Um, some of you interested in security might have also heard about uh, different attacks on the Intel architectures like Foreshadow. Uh, that is also work that has been done at the University of, uh, of Michigan. Uh, there are many interactive systems that researchers um, at the University of Michigan uh, create uh, in various domains ranging from health, transportation, uh, anything that improves uh, the quality of life of the different people and uh, their well-being. Uh, there's a focus on accessibility. Uh, not just in the classes that we offer, but also researchers who uh, dedicate their research to this important topic. One of the examples that you're seeing here is an intelligent robotic wheelchair developed at uh, CSC that can help with orientation and mobility for people who use uh, these wheelchairs. It is actually a part of an accessibility uh, class taught by uh, Professor David Chesney, where every year um, students come together to solve real life problems uh, for um, uh, people who are actually invited uh, to, uh, to present uh, and tell students about the challenges that they face, uh, in particular accessibility challenges, and that the students come together and uh, try to find innovative solutions to address those uh, challenges. Of course, there's a lot of robots always moving around uh, by Sir Building. Um, there's a very strong robotics group. So uh, the example here that you see is Magic. It's a, a little robot that is exceptionally good at avoiding uh, hitting people. Uh, and some of you might have seen interesting videos online of it uh, trying to um, kind of find its way through a crowd of people walking and at times uh, trying uh, to, to run into it. Uh, it's, it's a very, very funny video to see. And there are other examples as well. So uh, this is Odd Job. It's one of the, the two robots um, that uh, you will see either in different lab spaces or moving throughout the building. Uh, in uh, this particular robot, knows how to uh, grasp objects based on uh, their depth, uh, ba sorry, based on its depth and uh, color perception. Uh, and it's very interesting to see uh, how it does that from a pile of, uh, of different objects in, in front of it. So of course, that's just a, a, a small overview of some of the fun things that um, happen at the University of Michigan. I really invite you to look at the uh, virtual campus tour link. Uh, there, uh, among uh, many videos, uh, you will also see some examples, some demos of uh, the research that uh, happens at uh, University of Michigan CSC. And I hope uh, that you will find some interesting things that perhaps uh, you uh, may want to work on uh, in the future as well. Now, computer science and engineering uh, department is located in the North Campus, one of three campuses at the University of Michigan. Uh, in particular, we are located at the uh, Beister Building that I uh, already mentioned to you. Uh, this is a modern building that houses uh, both faculty and graduate student offices, uh, lab spaces, uh, and uh, different workspaces, uh, lectures, and also um, 
large halls, uh, presentation areas, and uh, conference rooms. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually a photo of our weekly tea hour while we were still back at uh, the uh, Pfizer building uh, before the, the pandemic, before we all um, started working from home. Um, and uh, here you can see students uh, socializing on, on the third floor um, right there in front of uh, our kitchen. So just looking at this photo makes me miss some of these events that, uh, that we would normally have. If you were to climb to one of the terraces of uh, our building, uh, this is the view that you would see, the view of uh, the clock tower uh, and just across uh, this uh, grove, uh, there is the Duderstad Center, uh, which houses a large library, um, many multimedia classrooms, even a maker space and most importantly, a coffee shop uh, as well. Um, right there next to it, we have the Pierpont Commons where we have the cafeteria, um, uh, com uh, campus uh, computer shop. Uh, there's a, a bank, credit union, bookstore, and also areas uh, for students where students can um, study, uh, socialize, and uh, so on. Now we are located on the North Campus, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, which is just a 15 minute ride, actually maybe more like a 10 minute ride uh, on one of our Michigan Blue Buses, which are um, free to students uh, to the Central Campus, uh, which is actually located uh, in downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, and it has quite a bit uh, to offer, both uh, when it comes to uh, different academic uh, buildings, um, but also uh, places where students, again, can come together and uh, socialize. Most of you are probably aware that Michigan, University of Michigan, is a huge um, sports, uh, or that we are huge sports fans. Uh, so there's the, um, uh, the usual call, uh, go blue. Um, the University of Michigan has not just uh, the Michigan Stadium, which is one of, one of the largest stadiums um, uh, for college football, but also um, stadiums for other sports, basketball, um, uh, soccer, um, and, and many more, together with uh, a lot of facilities that uh, support those sports, support the athletes, and also uh, that can be some of them that are specifically for faculty and students to, uh, to engage uh, in and, and use. University of Michigan has many libraries, uh, all with access to uh, students. Um, and uh, in addition to these different libraries, we also have museums, um, we have um, auditoriums, uh, so if uh, you're interested in these types of events and these types of activities, uh, you will definitely not be lacking them, of course, once we come back uh, to our campus. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of um, uh, buildings where we hold different events uh, and host visitors. Um, and um, uh, visitors such as yourself, if you were to come and visit us uh, at some point. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, University of uh, Michigan campus is located in Ann Arbor, uh, a small city uh, that has quite a bit uh, to offer. Uh, and again, I invite you to take a look at the link that we shared with you that uh, highlights some of the interesting spots in Ann Arbor uh, and things that uh, you can do. And of course, I would invite you to ask questions about uh, student life in Ann Arbor once we, um, or are, uh, once we are all joined by our graduate student uh, fac uh, panel uh, later in, in the day. But just as a... Um, uh, just a few highlights. Um, so Ann Arbor has a 
lot to offer, like I mentioned. Uh, one of the things certainly are coffee shops. Uh, now I can um, tell you that there are very good coffee shops and you can take my word for it because I am a bit of a coffee snob. Um, and of course, there's a lot of entertainment, um, restaurants, uh, uh, shops, uh, and of course, um, a lot of culture that, uh, that goes uh, with living in a university city like uh, Ann Arbor. Uh, we have uh, farmers markets, uh, we have many shops, as I mentioned before, there's opportunities for a lot of outdoor activities as well at uh, many, many parks uh, that we have in Ann Arbor. Uh, we organize uh, fairs uh, throughout the year. Um, and um, uh, of course, those, those are uh, usually uh, in the city itself and open to everyone to attend. Of course, one of the important things for you are, is probably student life. So in uh, CSC, we have a lot of student organizations. Uh, some examples are a sample of CS Ladies Plus, um, and all of these uh, uh, student organizations organize their own events, uh, try to raise awareness about the, the issues that they are interested in uh, and how, they're sol how they solve them. Um, all of these organizations are kind of under the umbrella of CSEG or Computer Science and Engineering Graduate uh, Student Organization, uh, which um, uh, all of the students are, or all of the graduate students are part of once they join uh, the University of Michigan. Um, in uh, spare time, students uh, also uh, take part in many activities around the campus. Now, I can't tell if this photo was taken during Michigan summer or winter, but uh, you can also, you can definitely see that there are some of these interesting activities outside um, in, um, outside, just outside of our uh, Beister building. Uh, students take part in, you know, sports, uh, they uh, take uh, breaks and uh, play, uh, they Organize, they take part in organized uh, activities. Um, uh, most of these activities are organized actually by uh, CSEG. Um, some of these uh, social uh, activities are also social activities. Uh, for example, the weekly tea time that I've already mentioned uh, before to you, uh, that actually now has uh, a virtual instantiation of uh, the event uh, while we are in, in the pandemic. Uh, there are many groups that come together and um, have fun activities like play games. Uh, and actually there is a, a special event. Um, every semester uh, we have a games class offered at computer science and engineering uh, department where at the end of the class, all of the, the students, all of the student groups uh, that were part of the class, they developed their own little games and then they have an opportunity to uh, present those games to everyone in CSC. Uh, so there are these, um, uh, game nights that are organized in the uh, Beister building in a large Tishman hall uh, at, at the bottom of the building where students come together and uh, they just uh, have a uh, fun time playing the games that their peers uh, created. So this was um, just a very, very quick overview of uh, some of the fun things uh, that, that uh, happen at CSC, uh, the research and the work that we do at CSC at the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, again, uh, please, please take a moment and take uh, a look at some of the links that we've, uh, that we've prepared uh, for you. Now, um, we still have um, some time before we take our break. Uh, and I would like to take a moment and um, invite any questions uh, from uh, you, from the audience, uh, and uh, try to answer them. And then once we're done, we can take a moment, break into uh, smaller groups and allow you to also meet uh, other uh, 
participants in, in the workshop uh, until we then come back for our uh, faculty panel. So please feel free to, for now, use the, the chat in Zoom and ask any questions that you might have. All right, so we have um, a question in chat. And it says, how much is the stipend for CSC RAs, TAs? Is there summer support and does the department offer fellowships? These are all excellent questions um, and some of them I can, I can try and answer right away. Now, um, I just wanna point out that we have uh, two programs for graduate students, a master's program and a PhD program. Uh, PhD students do receive a stipend um, they uh, are usually working as GSRAs, the graduate student research assistants, uh, where, where they do uh, research as part of their uh, dissertation. Uh, and then they also have an opportunity to be a GSI, so graduate student uh, instructors, which uh, gives you some uh, exposure to teaching um, and experience that is exceptionally valuable, especially for those who are hoping to go into the academia after their um, after their PhD. Uh, for master's students, uh, uh, these master's programs are uh, what we what we say what we call terminal programs. They are the programs uh, after which uh, usually there's an expectation that master's students will go in the industry. And currently, there are no um, uh, established stipends specifically for for uh, master's students. Although some master students are able to find GSRA positions and work with uh, different research labs at uh, at the university. Now, note here that the uh, expectation is that master students will mostly be focusing on uh, the coursework. Um, so there is no expectation that you must do research, but there are some opportunities. Uh, at the same time, there are also uh, opportunities for fellowships. Uh, some of them are at the department level. Some of them are uh, from the industry, from uh, different uh, foundations, including National Science Foundation and uh, so on. Um, we have a comment as well that says people already posted some questions in the faculty panel questions page. Um, thank you for, for that observation and thank you all uh, who have already posted questions there. Um, I would like to save those questions for our panel um, and answer any questions uh, that, uh, that maybe I can, I, any administrative questions that I can uh, answer while we are here. And then uh, we'll, we'll leave uh, others for the faculty panel to discuss. Um, what is the best way to know whether a certain professor takes PhD students this year or not? Um, so this is an excellent question for the faculty panel, but I will just answer this quickly uh, for you. Um, the best way is to try and contact the faculty directly. Um, of course, you know, everyone is busy, uh, including you and the faculty. I know it's not easy to send these kinds of cold emails, but if you are able to structure your email uh, in a uh, very nice way where you are able to describe your interest, uh, where you're able to show that you understand the research interest of uh, the faculty that you're hoping to work with, um, then you will increase your chances to actually get a response, uh, a response that will also include answers to these kinds of questions. So uh, I'd say the best way to uh, find that out is to, um, is to contact our faculty directly. And actually, uh, that is something that I would uh, recommend all of you do. Uh, after this workshop. Uh, usually there would be some opportunities to meet directly with individual faculty during uh, our workshop, 
that is not necessarily possible in a virtual format, but I did uh, talk to a lot of my colleagues and a lot of them uh, said that they would be happy to, to receive uh, some of these questions directed at them uh, and try and answer them um, that way. Um, Okay, then we have a question that says, uh, approximately how long do PhD students in CSC take to complete their dissertation from the point they, that uh, they start? Um, so this is a, a very good question, but a question that is fairly difficult to answer simply because um, there's a lot of differences uh, between uh, student dissertations. Uh, some are able to complete it in shorter period of time. Some are able to complete it in longer period of time. And, um, you know, for those of you, those who completed, who take a little bit longer, uh, there's no need to pass judgment. It could be just that the kind of topic that they um, tackled required more time. Uh, but I would say that the normally uh, students take about five years to uh, complete uh, the PhD program. And again, some take a little bit um, uh, shorter, some take longer, and that is, of course, fine. Um, can you tell us a bit about your research and teaching at Michigan? Now, I am not uh, sure if this is specifically about um, my own research and teaching uh, or about uh, research and teaching in general. Uh, I will assume that it's the broader question, uh, just uh, because uh, not everyone might have uh, the same kind of interest that I do. Uh, I will just mention that I am a computer scientist with uh, focus on uh, research in human computer interaction or HCI, uh, where I study uh, uh, how humans interact with technology and try to create innovative uh, uh, new uh, designs uh, that uh, help people uh, improve the quality of their lives uh, and their, their well-being. But more broadly, like I said at the beginning, uh, the research here at, at University of Michigan is very, very broad. Um, we tackle every aspect of uh, computer science and engineering. And in addition to that, uh, we also have very, very close collaborations with other um, departments and schools within uh, University of Michigan. Uh, some of those include, for example, uh, uh, School of Information, uh, which we have very, very close uh, relationship with. A lot of uh, faculty also work closely with uh, uh, Michigan Medicine um, and do a lot of work in the healthcare domain. Uh, there, we also have uh, strengths in uh, and connections with automotive industry. And then, of course, more broadly with, with other industries um, as well. Uh, when it comes to teaching, also I would like to point out that just like with research, with teaching, we cover uh, every aspect of computer science and, and engineering, uh, and there's um, um, a broad offering of courses in uh, every what we like to call concentration area, uh, and those concentration areas are the five areas that I mentioned before, uh, theory, um, AI, uh, systems, hardware, and then interactive systems. Um, and for each of those uh, concentration areas, we have uh, what we call breadth courses, courses that give you an overview of uh, those fields. Those are also required as part of uh, both uh, master's and PhD programs. And then we have many different depth courses that um, that go in depth uh, in various uh, often cutting edge uh, uh, subfields of computer science and engineering. And in addition to that, you of course, again, have the opportunity to take uh, classes from any of the, the other parts uh, of the university, any other colleges and schools. Uh, in fact, not just that it's encouraged, that uh, there's a requirement that uh, students should take uh, a cognate course uh, and get exposure to some of the, the, the interesting uh, knowledge uh, outside of just simply CSC research. Um, okay. Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm just going through some of these questions. Some of them are private uh, and I will not automatically assume that I should uh, read them directly, uh, but I will try to answer once I answer all of the, all of the other uh, questions. Um, how does the department help support students who are struggling to publish and or move uh, to candidacy? This is a very uh, important question um, because it, it uh, shows that, you know, we, we are in this together. When we admit you into the program, uh, our goal is for you to be successful. Now, what we do is we do have um, uh, what we call yearly reviews, uh, which are not so much reviews of the student performance as much as opportunities for faculty to come together and uh, uh, look at ways in which we can um, support the students, uh, even, of course, students, especially students uh, who may be uh, uh, struggling, for example, uh, and then try and find different strategies um, to, to help them. There are uh, also many, um, many uh, organizations, not just at the department level, but at the university level that can help uh, both with, uh, you know, uh, 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 technical, well, uh, skills side of things, um, help with the writing, with the communication, uh, to things like uh, uh, help students deal with mental health uh, and and some of the you know the pressures and the stresses that they might experience as part of their uh, graduate uh, studies. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we we provide support financial support to all of the uh, guarantee financial support to all of the PhD students, um, and we also uh, have a um, large number of uh, faculty. Uh, which helps with uh, any kind of uh, issues that might arise uh, or any kind of challenges um, when students are working directly with uh, their advisors and maybe the relationship is not uh, working out. There, there are mechanisms that help students switch advisors. There's enough faculty uh, in the department so that uh, students actually have a choice if uh, some of these uh, previous relationships are not uh, working out and so on. But thank you. That is that is a that is an excellent question, and I, actually, I would invite you to ask that question a, again, uh, both at the faculty panel and at the graduate student panel, because some of our faculty are actually involved in uh, some of these initiatives, and of course, graduate students would uh, know uh, very well um, what you're talking about because they're experiencing this um, as well. Um, uh is there any change in the application timeline due to the pandemic i do not believe that there are specifically changes in the timeline itself uh, but there are some changes uh, when it comes to relaxing uh, some of the the requirements uh, so like many universities out there we do not specifically require gres this year um, but of course, uh, there there's still certain things that uh, that we we have to require, though um, they may be challenging to 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 get this uh, this year. Um, uh, one being, for example, recommendation letters. Um, for non PhD students, masters only. Is it okay to be still motivated by research at the University of Michigan, and do they get a chance to work? Uh, uh, project with the professor who is working in that field? This is an excellent question. Um, so yes, the answer is definitely yes. Um, a lot of our master's students are actually motivated by the cutting edge research uh, that we do at the University of Michigan, not just to learn how to do some of these cutting edge things uh, through classes, but actually get involved with research. And there are many opportunities uh, from uh, opportunities to do uh, independent studies uh, with uh, different faculty where you can actually get credit for doing that research. Uh, but also, as I mentioned before, sometimes even uh, uh, 
in a relationship where uh, you're working directly as a GSRA or a graduate student research assistant. Um, I uh, had wonderful experience working with, uh, with many master's students. Um, and uh, I have to say what, one of my PhD students, one of my current PhD students, uh, actually, I'm sorry, two of them uh, were master's students, uh, one at CSC, one at ECE. Uh, at the University of Michigan, and they just uh, simply then um, c continued on uh, with, with their PhD. And, th you know, those are just two examples, but there's, there's so many examples of students uh, doing that. So yes, this is, this is you know, uh, not just uh, welcome, but also encouraged in many ways. Uh, I'm sorry, I just need to keep track of uh, the questions. Um, may I ask when the faculty panel questions link will be closed? I'm thinking of referring back to it later today. Uh, that is a very good question. We will definitely have it open during the faculty panel. Um, we um, obviously after the faculty panel is is done, we will uh, close it for additional questions. But I will do uh, what I can to uh, make the questions still available uh, to you. Uh, and of course, we are also going to make the recordings of this workshop available to you so you can refer back to some of these panels and actually not just hear the questions, but hear the answers. Um, okay, somebody just, uh -huh. oh, yes. thank you, Sonia. Sonia is uh, one of our administrators uh, working at the um, CSC graduate office uh, who confirmed that December 15th uh, is the deadline for PhD applications and January 15th for master's applications. All right, so uh, we have another question here. For someone who has been in industry for two plus years now and wishing to join the master's only program, which um, all or ours are preferred, industry, tech, or academic? Please ignore the... Uh, uh, so I don't necessarily think it says, please ignore if, if, if we're going to talk about it, how to apply to graduate school. I don't think we will specifically uh, touch on this question simply because there's a lot of material we have to cover and a lot of tips to give you about uh, specifically how to prepare uh, materials. Um, but I would say that uh, you have, uh, when it comes to opportunities to take classes that will uh, prepare you uh, both for, uh, for industry and for research, uh, they exist out there. Actually, in fact, I would say that the way that our master's program is structured, the idea is that you will uh, take, uh, you will get some practical knowledge about uh, computer science uh, and engineering uh, work that you will be able to take into the industry. Um, so um, that is definitely something that you will have an opportunity to do. Not, not so much uh, uh, academic research unless you choose um, um, to do so uh, yourself, right? Get involved in the research. Nicola, I had a short answer for that as well. Of course. I entered it already. Uh huh. Thank you. Um, perfect. Thank you, Sonia. That's that's an excellent answer. Um, well, I'll try to answer a couple of more of these. We are coming close to um, the end of this uh, uh, this uh, section. Uh, will master program applications be a disadvantage if they don't submit GRE scores? No. Uh, we cannot say you're not required to submit GRE scores and then go back behind your back and, and count them and, and you know, put you at a disadvantage. So no, we, we specifically do not ask for GRE scores this year. Um, you are still, uh, I believe, able to submit them if you choose to do so, um, but, um, but uh, like I said, uh, there will not be uh, a criteria uh, this year. Are students from interdisciplinary, oh, sorry, uh, this is a private question, so I shouldn't have just assumed. Um, uh, if you do send private questions, uh, please uh, send me another private message and let me know if you give me the permission to actually read the question out loud and, and answer it. Um, uh -huh. Okay, I just got the permission. Thank you so much for that. 
Are students from interdisciplinary backgrounds accepted if they are interested in the HCI focus area for PhD? Or is the expectation still that the students have a strong technical background? Uh, this is, uh, this is a very, very good question and does not necessarily apply only to the field of uh, human-computer interaction or HCI, although uh, HCI may be uh, 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 very, very interdisciplinary that way. Um, I will say that uh, there are some expectations that even if you don't necessarily have exceptionally strong technical background that you will be able uh, to uh, develop it. Uh, simply because uh, we want to make sure that, that you are successful in the program, right? So uh, in CSE, the, the, the classes that you will be taking, the research that you will be doing is, is highly technical. Even HCI research is technical HCI research. Uh, and, and there the expectation is that you will be able to both study uh, computer systems, but also uh, design and, and create them. Uh, but we have many, many examples. Uh, I, I, don't wanna, I don't want my answer to discourage you because we have many examples of students who come from uh, other fields um, and take the right kind of courses uh, that, um, that prepare them uh, for this kind of work. One of the, one of the students that uh, just came to mind is a student who uh, was a JD, had a, had a law degree, um, and then decided to take the master's program uh, uh, here at CSC, get the, the background uh, necessary to be able to do technical work, and is now a PhD student at, at CSC. Um, so I hope, I hope that, that answered your question to some degree. So I don't think that you would be automatically at a disadvantage, but I know that the Graduate Admissions Committee always looks to make sure that, uh, uh, that we are not setting up anyone for, for failure if, if we are not able to provide you with the education that will help you succeed. A um, couple of more questions. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, Jerry's, oh, sorry, that's Sonia again, uh, clarifying. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, what is different for people applying straight from undergrad without any work experience or grad school experience? Um, well, there, there are um, a lot of uh, things that come down to the individual level. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, this in how to apply to, to graduate school, how to call out some of these individual strengths uh, that you have, uh, whether you are uh, an undergraduate student, whether you're a student who had some uh, ad additional uh, experience, uh, either in the industry or uh, graduate school experience. Uh, but um, it's really about finding ways to uh, describe, to persuade the graduate admissions uh, committee uh, that uh, you will be successful in the program, uh, regardless of, um, of uh, uh, where you're coming from, right? What your background is and, and what, uh, what are the kind of uh, current, um, you know, opportunities that, that, uh, that you were able to get. Because at the end of the day, graduate school, both master's and PhD program, it's cool. If you already knew how to do everything that we teach you, you, you wouldn't have to come to school. We would just give you, uh, you know, a professor position, let's say, if, if you're going for PhD. Uh, so instead, uh, here, it shouldn't be the focus uh, necessarily on uh, have you already done everything that we expect from PhD students. The focus should be on uh, why will uh, the program, not just our program, but uh, programs more broadly, why would, are they, um, why will they give you the kind of knowledge that you need to accomplish your future goals? But I, I will talk a little bit more about this uh, during the, the workshop itself. Uh, and I, please, you know, if, if I do not specifically touch on this question again, please remind me. Let me look through this very quickly because we only have five more minutes. Um, Uh, there's another private question uh, that, again, I will just uh, invite uh, the, 
the person who, who uh, posted it to tell me in, in another private message whether they are fine with me sharing this or not. So I will move on, uh, but can come back to that question if we have time. Uh, how many students does your department take for PhD programs? Uh, I assume that this is uh, per year. Um, so um, this is, uh, we, uh, there's a difference between uh, how many admission offers we make versus how many um, uh, students actually matriculate or how many of them accept uh, our offers. Uh, we tend to uh, send uh, about 100, a little bit over 100 um, uh, a little bit over uh, 100 uh, admissions. I know this year it was uh, around 100, maybe around 110. Uh, the year before it was around 120. And of course, uh, Sonia can um, can uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong in, in these numbers. Uh, okay, we, we have a permission for one of these questions. So uh, while evaluating PhD applications, uh, are people coming from terminal MS programs at a disadvantage compared to students coming directly from undergraduate programs, or are there any different set of expectations? Um, so uh, again, this is very specific to, to your case. I wouldn't say that there's anyone who is immediately at a disadvantage. Uh, you're all coming with different experiences and you're all coming with different strengths and you're all coming with different goals. So being able to uh, clearly articulate those goals and why a PhD or a master's program will help you accomplish those goals and why you will be able to successfully complete uh, the program is something that, that you should highlight based on the experiences uh, and the background that, that you have. Uh, we do not put anyone uh, at a disadvantage uh, simply because they, you know, took a master's program. If anything, uh, if, if you have a master's degree, you already have some additional experience uh, that, that you can talk about and you can say why it prepared you for the PhD program. <clears throat> 